Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wa sallallahu alaihi sayyidina Muhammad Rasulillah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Surah Al-Baqarah is a lot of um, superlatives in one. It's the longest surah in the Quran. It has contains within it the longest verse in the Quran. It also contains within it the most um, auspicious verse in the Quran. The Ayat al-Kursi, the Prophet ﷺ said about it that it's the, the Ashrafu uh, Ayat al-Quran. The most ennobled of all of the verses of the Quran, the single most. It's also the first surah that was revealed in Medina. And therefore, it's really unique because if you think Al-Fatiha was of course from the very, very early Meccan surahs. And then the next thing you encounter is a surah that was revealed after Hijrah. So all of the other surahs that were revealed in that 13 years pre-Hijrah, they're kept right to the end of the Quran. And there's a great reason for that and one that we can talk about when we get there. But for now, it's a Quran which, uh, the, the Al-Baqarah, is a surah that does lots of things. It's addressing a community in a very cosmopolitan context. There are Jewish people around you. And it's not just addressing the Muslim community, it's addressing the Jewish community too. There are now issues of governance and politics and relationships uh, and covenants among yourself and your social contract, but also uh, your international relations, your, the way that you interact with, engage with other peoples and communities, war and peace and buying and selling and a lot of ahkam. So it's very uh, ahkam law heavy. But it's never just legal. It's also an idea of the past. And it's one of the very first stories that Al-Baqarah gives us is goes so far back in history that it goes to the very beginnings of man with Adam alayhi salam. So the very one of the first stories that you'll encounter therefore tells you about the beginning of your your own kind. That's the point of this surah. And then it's very universal. In Mecca there's a small community of people who worshipped Allah alone, who followed what the Messenger had to give them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now it's, it's telling you, you don't exist in a vacuum. The message is universal and it's requiring you to become uh, a lot more universal in your approach. The message addresses not just Bani Israel, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, call to mind my favours that I bestowed upon you. It does that. But it's also, Ya Yuhannas, O'abudu Rabbakum, O people. Humankind, if you're a human being, this applies to you. People, worship your Lord. Give uh, honor, give reverence to your Lord. So this is, it's, it's a hugely, it's, and this is why, from the great wisdom of the Creator, why keep a surah that was revealed more than 13 years after the Quran first uh, began to come down? Make that the, 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 the second Surah of the Quran. And there is a second Surah of the Quran. Fatiha almost um, behaves like a foreword. Fatiha is like a prelude. You know, it's, it's this, it's a dua, it's the essence of the Quran, it's all of these things. So the first thing that you're looking to for detail, of course, is Al Baqarah. Because this Ummah is created to be cosmopolitan. This Ummah. Uh, bears a universal message. It's in its destiny and fate that it must work amongst all of the peoples of this world. This is why Al-Baqarah is the first of the uh, surahs with, 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 with any length that you encounter. After Al-Fatiha serving almost as an introduction and a spiritual um, uh, orientation. It's, orient, it's an orientation spiritually, Al-Fatiha, and then the first of the input is in Al-Baqarah. 
Al-Baqarah begins with Alif and Lam and Mim. Almost from the outset to tell you everything that you know can be reduced to things of which you have no knowledge. Human beings are human beings because we speak. One of the defining features and characteristics of what it is to be human through every culture and civilization. You've, there are cultures in the world where they don't eat rice. Patans don't eat much rice. There are cultures in the world where if you don't eat rice, you've not had a meal. I heard about some Bengali people who were being entertained at a Pakistani's home and, uh, and they were served with roti and sal and lots of things. And then somebody came and said, Mashallah, you've eaten. They said, no, 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 we've not. I said, what do you mean? We've just had the meal. He said, oh, I thought that was just nashta. I thought that was just the, uh, the kind of, you know, beginnings. There's no rice. Rice hasn't come. It's not a meal unless there's rice involved. There are other people who... So people are lots of different things. People who, who, who lived in, in mountains and, and, and huge hills and others who lived on flat land. And some people made their dwellings in forests. And we've done all sorts of things. The one thing that you'll never find a community has ever existed without is language. We are, by our definition... In fact, do you know... How do you... What, what's the... What's the How do we uh, scientifically speak of the human being? Any ideas? What's the, the, the scientific designation for the human being? Homo sapien, right? Which, what does that mean? Homo is man. Sapien is intelligent the thinking or the wise or the intelligent man which is anything that walks on two legs as opposed to so or homo erectus onwards that's the way that um that that western sciences define the human being but guess how the 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 arab or the islamic um sciences spoke of the human being as Hayawanun Natib, the speaking animal. The only animal with the spoken word. Other animals have sounds. They chirp and they bark and they bray and they neigh and they do lots of other things. But the only ones which have language, much more than just the ability to emit sounds to convey general moods, language, very specific, very sophisticated, very exact. And it's about the way that I breathe out how crazy is that it's just how i exhale air that's in my lungs through my throat with muscles um you know contorted in certain ways creates vibrations traveling through the 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 air that bounce against your eardrums that instantaneously are projecting inside your head images pictures i can say something make you all laugh and then another thing and make you all sad and all of that is just because of how i breathed have you ever thought about that? The breath of Allah is what he calls the human being. And one of the first things he does is he gives to Adam, Adam al -asma, the knowledge of names. And then he says it to the angels. You, you give, uh, name these, they, we can't. Did I not tell you that I know what I do? So man is ennobled through the knowledge of names, the ability to name stuff. Because if you can name a thing, then you have known it. And you have, to an extent, subdued it. Uh, you, have, you have authority and power over it. So these are all the great things that... But, for all of the great knowledge that we have, and our ability to speak about things in so many languages, you can speak Urdu and English and Swahili and Uruba and... Uh, did I say that right? Yoruba, sorry and uh, Bengali and, and, and all sorts of different things you can speak in. Every single... Uh, we, just like noise itself, sound, your ability to hear sound. You can hear so many different sounds. You can hear high pitches and low notes and you can hear children and birds and all sorts of things, right? But it's limited to a spectrum. There are sounds that dogs and cats can hear that you and I can't. The pitch isn't... And the same happens with light. We can see all sorts of things in every color of the rainbow, but actually not. Because 
anything that's on one end of the spectrum or the other, ultraviolet or, um, or, or uh, you know, the, 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 I, we can't see those things. We have to use technology to be able to see those, but otherwise we can't see something because it's too far off. The, so there's a set spectrum for sight, for hearing. Allah says to us, your intelligence, the very first thing you have to encounter in order to learn is your own limitations. And so the surah begins with alif, lam, meem. The stuff of with which language is made. The stuff of which language is made. And you know languages. And you've made poems and, 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 and written uh, stories and all sorts of things. But you don't know what the individual sounds that you utter on their own what they mean that's the limitation of your knowledge you know alam the word alam is a is an arabic word it means pain alam so if i looked at alif lam mim as one and i saw the word alam i know what that means but if you show me the alif and say what does that mean it's a letter but what does it mean what does a mean i don't know what does l mean i don't know m Children learn phonetically. Before ABC, they learn of Abaka. Every one of those is filled with meaning. Nothing is without meaning. Just because you and I don't know it, Allah says, uh, Subhanaka, or He asks us in the Quran in, towards the end of the surah to say, In the creation of the heavens and the earth. In the interchange between night and day, la'ayat, in all of those are signs. They're all pregnant with signs, filled with meaning. Li'ulil albab, for people of depth, not for superficial people. If you're going to be superficial, then yeah, it's just a tree, it's just a sunset, it's just a sound, up. Uh. But for people of given to deep reflection and pondering, and they're all signs, every one of these is a sign, and a sign points somewhere. Where do they point to? To the Creator. And then he explains who they are. Those who think deeply in the creation of heaven and earth and then are forced to the conclusion, Rabbana, ma khalaqta hadha batila. O our Lord, not without purpose have you created this. Nothing that he created is without purpose and that's even down to individual letters like Alif, Lam and Mim. That's the start of the surah to, so that you confront your limitations and your ignorance. And then he begins with this very powerful, this is a book that has no doubt in it. And it is a guidance. It's, the book guarantees guidance. And yet not everyone who reads the book is guided. Because it also says, Huda lil muttaqin. It is guidance, but it requires you to be a certain way to be guided by it. Be God conscious. Be in awe of Allah. Cynicism is like the great disease of hearts and the great disease of humanity. It robs, like takes beauty away from everything and, 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 and it reduces the vastly beautiful to plain and mundane and boring. Cynicism. You can look at a beautiful sunset and be wowed by it. And somebody like, yeah, you know, that's just uh, the refraction of light uh, and... Well, okay, thank you very much. So this is to say to us, the book is guidance if you are a people in awe of your creator. So don't allow cynicism to take over. Be awed, be wowed by creation. And then it tells you a little bit about that because some people can be, you know, love God. Some people say, I'm not very religious, but I'm very spiritual. So Allah says to us, look, spiritual is amazing, but be grounded. Because you don't just sort of eat spiritual food and not eat physical food. You are a creature of mind, body and soul. Don't deprive any part of your being, any part of you, you with being in connection with your creator. And so the first thing it tells us about in defining al-muttaqeen, who are the people of guidance or the people of, of God consciousness and taqwa who ultimately are the people who are guided by this book. Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb. Those who, who have affirmed their faith in that which they cannot see. To believe in what you see is easy. Everyone does that. You see a fire, everyone runs out. And you see like a, you know, a, a snake. And a, to believe in beyond what you can see. 
So there are some people who believe and strongly believe that if we um, don't look after our environment, then there are going to be massive repercussions. Now, some people, just because you can't see it, I can't see how, uh, you know, dumping non-biodegradable plastic uh, wherever I go is, is making it any impact, any perceivable impact to my world, to my creation. So that's being limited only by what you can see in front of your noses. But today we care about the environment increasingly because even we're, we're aware that you know, climate change is a thing and that the world around us, we have to respect that. Believing in what you, in, in al ghaib beyond what you can see, is not being limited to just the here and now. It's not being um, like uh, impetuous, you know, which is whatever you feel like, impulsive. Impulsive. When you feel like something, oh, I feel like this, I'm going to go and eat that, I feel like that, I'll do that. And there's no thought for consequences. If you, you can't see when you eat a single biscuit that you've necessarily, that's had any impact on your weight. But someone who cares about their weight is like, no, no, I can't eat that, I've got to be good. Why? What's that one biscuit? Eat it. Can you demonstrate, just because I can't physically demonstrate right now the impact of one cookie, I know it and I believe in it. And that belief in beyond what is physically visible right now inspires me to be very good even when I'm super tempted. And everyone around me is like, you know, gorging their faces on cake. I'm, I'm not because I know that I still need to try to get into those trousers and all of this. So that's belief in beyond what you can see. Allah says, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ It's farsightedness. It's believing beyond the reaches of your physical eyes. وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَةِ And therefore establishing prayer because you don't want to lose sight. You can glimpse a thing and then you can lose sight of that. How do you maintain some consistency, some permanence? How do you keep it alive? The prayer. أَقِيمِ الصَّلَةَ لِذِكْرِ For the purpose of my remembrance, establish prayer. And don't just be a people who have got great faith and great worship of your creator. Become a people who are great towards creation too. And of all that we have granted them, they spend. They spend on others. You can't spend on yourself. Well, you could. Obviously, you do. We do. We spend on ourselves. But it means it's spending all around. And this isn't just money. It's not about your wealth only. Everything that Allah has granted you, that includes your smile. That's, just, that's something that I like to give to you. It includes your, your you, you know how to do a thing which somebody else doesn't. You teach them how to do that. You've shared, you've given of what Allah gave to you. You, you, you help somebody who's really in pain and suffering and you give them a, a shoulder to cry and you give them a hug. You sit with them, you support them, you give them companionship and love. Something that Allah gave you. These are all of that which Allah, we have granted them, they spend. And then... They, they don't reject the messenger and they don't reject what Allah has revealed to the messenger. They treat it as important, not like as it's, it's a nice thing, but it's not really for me. It's a nice thing, but there are, it's disposable. No, they believe in what we have revealed to you, uh, what was revealed to you. وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ And what was revealed before you. وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُقِنُونَ and in the hereafter, they have firm conviction. They know this story doesn't end with death. You bury your dead and you come back home again. But that's not the end. That's only the very beginning of the greater story. And they have faith in that. And so Allah describing these attributes then says, <laughs> These are they who are on guidance from their Lord. These are the ones who are on guidance. وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And these are the people of Falah. Falah. Muflih, successful. Hayya ala salah. Hayya ala al falah. Five times a day he calls out. Come to prayer, come to success. Almost every time the word falah or its derivative is used in the Quran, the salah mentioned just before it. Qad aflah al or just after it. Qad aflah al mu'minun. Alladina hum fi salatihim khashi'oon. Truly successful other believers, in their prayer they are humble. Here, just two verses above, وَيُقِيمُونَ salata. Success, salah is central to success. Okay, as I've said now, so this Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, snapshot tafsir, I have to keep reminding myself this is what this is about. So, Al-Baqarah, introduction to 
the successful to believers. And then a quick mention in two lines of, about um, a term we're all very familiar with, the kuffar, kafir. Inna ladina kafaru. I'd like you to join me in the translation of this. Inna ladina kafaru. Indeed, those who have disbelieved, the kuffar, the kafirs. Gore is not um, a synonym, just to be clear. Uh, those who have rejected the kuffar. Sawa'una alayhim. It is the same to them. Aanzartahum. Whether you warn them. Aanzartahum amlam tunzirhum. Or do not warn them. La yu'minun. They will not believe. So that's a big, big thing to say. Can I ask you, has anyone met such a thing as a convert to Islam? Some of you have? I believe there might even be one or two in this room today. Now the Quran, the very first thing it tells us about kuffar is they can never believe. A kafir will never be a believer. So like, whoa. And this is revealed when? It's revealed to Muhammad, وسلم, who is, he's like, Primary job role is what? Call it to God by his leave and a bright light. He, he came to all of these people who were at one point kuffar. <coughs> and he called and he pleaded and he, he gave them good news and glad tidings and he gave them warnings. Bashiran and Nadiran. And he did all of this and then so, and a, a good number of them said, what you're saying is true. And they said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah. They became Muslim. Right? So now we have to understand, and this is why literalism is a massive problem. Don't come to the Quran like literalists, because you do a disservice to the book, you do a disservice to yourself, and you do a disservice to the world if you, if you just choose to be literalist in your application, understanding, and in explanation of Islam. Those who disbelieve, never will they believe. What does that possibly mean? It means don't make the mistake of, of thinking anyone who's not said La ilaha illallah is a kafir in the full sense, fullest sense of what kafir is. So we're human beings in this world. We have no option but to say so this person says La ilaha illallah is a Muslim. If they die, I'll do janazah. If they want to like, you know, marry... Uh, a member of the Muslim community, they marry also, and somebody else, he's, he, he um, worships at a church or a synagogue or in a temple or, you know, something else. So he's a kafir. Uh, that, that's what, you know, that's the black and white. And to it, for um, utility's sake, for in, in dunya we terms, that's the way that you'd see the black and white. Don't, don't make the mistake of thinking in Allah's eyes. Allah is as bound to this very literal uh, distribution as we are. Because I can't look into anyone's hearts and determine to what extent they are committed to the truth. And the only reason they've not said La ilaha illallah is because they've not as of yet encountered that. And yet, should they encounter it, tomorrow they'll become a Muslim. And many of you will, you know, we, we, people who at one point, I have a friend who was, uh, he, he was a Catholic, he's a Muslim. And he always speaks of, when I worshipped Allah in the church, he said, because I was never a disbeliever. I never disbelieved my Lord. I worshipped him always. Before I used to worship him in a church, now I worship him in the masjid. There's some things about the creed that didn't fully make sense, and then I found Islam and it all made perfect sense. But I was always a worshipper of God. This first statement about inna ladina kafaru is telling us something that is potentially like mind-blowing, and yet no one stops to think about that. Because if... It is as simplistic as non-Muslim equals kafir. Then not a single non-Muslim should ever be able to become a Muslim. It should be impossible. In which case, Umar would never become a Muslim. And any other Sahabi. And you can forget about like trying to do da'wah or anything else. Because the Quran's just said it. Verse number 6 of Al-Baqarah. Those who disbelieve, it's all the same. Warn them, don't warn them. They won't believe. This is talking about those who are truly in the truest sense of the term, committed to an antagonistic uh, rejection, a rebellion. 
But not everyone falls into that. Although in this world, now Imam Ahmed relates an important hadith, an interesting hadith, and he says, there are people who will rise before Allah on the last day and they'll say, Ya Allah, your messengers came and we were too old or infirm to understand what they had to say. Another man will say, Ya Allah, your messenger came and I wasn't intelligent enough to understand what he had to say. Another one will say, Ya Allah, your messenger came and I was deaf, I could hardly hear. Another one will say, Allah, your messenger didn't get to me. And that includes not only those who didn't receive prophets, those who received only distorted versions of their message fall into that too. So your message didn't come to me. So Allah will say to them, will you commit to now to be obedient to me? And they will say yes. And those, and, and those who do are entered into Jannah. And yet they left this world uh, being considered, you know, not a Muslim. Because they had, they were. So this is important to get. There, this isn't, it's not, a, it's not as simple as a label. He's called Bob and, or Steve, and so clearly he's not a Muslim. And mashallah, he's called Abu Bakr or Umar or Khalid, and so he's. There can be Abu Bakrs and Umars and Khalids who, who, who have rejected, and there are Bobs and Steves and who are massively devoted. And this is it's about here. It's not the label. And this is why Allah says, hearts can be sealed to the truth and ears turned away, and eyes blinded. Okay. So a few verses about believers. Two statements about disbelievers that it's not. Disbeliever equaling non-Muslim, but really a disbeliever in the fullest sense of that. And then there's a statement about those who, the, the hypocrites. And that's big. Hypocrites, there's about 11 verses then, which Allah devotes to talking about those who play with the truth. Don't become a people who play with the truth. Allah starts with, There are people who say, we believe in God on the last day. And they have no belief. So be afraid of that. And there are attributes and practices which can take us there. Like I've said, cynicism is the death of, of, of the human being. And you can become, and if you, if you, if a person, you know how in anything you can become Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, you should consider it makruh to stay in Makkah longer than, uh, you know, for, for, any duration of time after which you begin to lose the sanctity of, the, of, of Makkah. He says, if you've, you've overstayed your welcome, leave. Don't let Makkah ever become a normal common place to you. Where every stone is, is, has a sanctity. It's the haram. You can't even pluck its grass. Did you know that? In Makkah, you can't even pluck out its grass. The Prophet gave permission for Ithmid. And he said, other than that, this is sacred land. Don't be fooled by the skyscrapers and the shopping complexes and the other things, you know, the, the fast food chains. Don't be fooled. This is a sacred place. Abu Hanifa said it is makruh for you to stay in Makkah after the point when the sanctity of the, this place leaves your heart. This is why cynicism is bad. And this is why when Allah speaks about the munafiqeen, he's talking about actions, cynical actions. And we're all in danger of that because when you encounter faith, it's very easy. You know, when you first come to faith, everything is so important. How I make salah is important. How I make wudu is important. How I stand and, and place my hands and my feet. All of these things are so important, so attentive to detail. And then the time comes when, mashallah, I've been doing salah for 55 years now. Allahu Akbar. You just do it and it's done. And Don't... Be afraid of, make, of, of ever reducing it. It should always be. Every prayer. They say like your last prayer, like your first prayer also. Like your last prayer, like you're about to leave the world. But like your first prayer, like this is all it matters. Because a lack of that is what leads to nifaq. And nifaq has levels. And the most extreme form of that is absolute nifaq. Where people say... I believe and actually they don't believe and they're quite happy to admit it in the company of other like-minded people that they're only infiltrators and whatever. That's an extreme form but there's varying degrees. The Prophet of Allah said Nifaq has three or four characteristics. Anyone who has all of these characteristics he's like a complete munafiq and anyone who has one or, or, or more of these Fihi khaslatun min nifaq He has a characteristic of hypocrisy. One of those is إِذَا خَاصَمَ fajr. When he falls into a disagreement, he starts using foul language. إِذَا وَعْدَ أَخْلَفْ When he promises, he breaks his promise. إِذَا تُمِنَ khan. If he's trusted with a thing, he betrays the trust. And um, 
إذا حدث كذب when he speaks he lies Al Bukhari saw a man with uh, stones in his thing and he's an old man an old man and his horse was a distance away he's trying to get the horse to come close he did this and he rattled some stones around so that the horse would come trotting over thinking it's food and of course it's only stones but now he's got the horse and he's an old man he's not gonna so when he came and Imam Bukhari had traveled to take hadith from this man he traveled to take hadith and then he saw him just as he was arriving, doing this with these stones. And he looked in and he said, what was in there? He said, only stones. You deceived your horse. Aslamu alaikum, I'm going home. <laughs> he didn't take hadith from him. You, you, you deceived another creature. Now, that's extreme. Al-Bukhari, Allah bless him, is an old man. You can make a lot of excuses for him. But this was their attention to detail because this message is about truth. And the truth is never served with falsehood. There are people who will send around WhatsApp messages and posts online. And they're lies. Like completely made up things. MashaAllah, anyone who uh, does 25 namazis today of the saying, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad 17 times, and then, he, then you know, like you'll go straight to Jannah even. Why do you make rubbish up? There's so much truth to get, and that's in Bukhari and Muslim and authentic places of hadith. People make up things. And uh, MashaAllah, this is the month of Rajab. The first person who tells someone else it's Rajab, then uh, Allah makes Jahannam haram for him. Have you heard that one? Allah doesn't make Jahannam for haram for anyone for telling you what month it is. Seriously. Otherwise, every news reporter would be going straight to Jannah, mashallah. No, you know. So don't make rubbish up. This truth, the truth, and so lying, lying is, is from this. Okay, anyway, we have to move on. Uh, do you have Qur'ans with you? You have and you've got it on apps and things. So I should have mentioned this. And I thought, oh, I should have told Father. And I thought, no, no, but everyone will know if you're coming to a Quran class, of course, bring your Quran. So if you haven't, please bring your Quran. And yours, I mean the one that you like to study from, the translation one, with the Arabic, but the translation. Because I'm going to say, let's get, jump to the, look at verse 29, 21 now. And that's exactly what I'm going to say. Let's look at verse 21 now, guys. Lord, people, worship your Lord. Worshipping of Allah is... Uh, is the divine message straight after talking about munafiqun? Now I've said to you that he starts with believers, al muttaqin not just Muslims, people who are conscious about God, people who care, people who are in awe. Then he says two lines about those who have rejected, because that actually is a very small minority of people who have actually rejected, you know, and actually become sworn enemies to the truth. Very few people are like that. And then there's all this stuff about hypocrites, because that's a very complicated and a very dangerous area, so be wary of that. And then comes, Ya ayyuhan nasu abudu rabbakum. O people, people, worship your Lord. And scholars have traditionally said things like, Allah's divided people into three categories here. There's the believer, there's the disbeliever, there's the munafiq. But actually, if you look at it, he's dividing people into four here. There's the believer of the God conscious. There's the sworn rejecter. That's not every non-Muslim. It's a sworn rejecter. The one who is so adamant he'll never believe. That certainly isn't every non-Muslim because many of them, mashallah, do. And then there's the munafiq, the hypocrite. But then there's another group, an-nas, people. The generality of people, that's what the vast majority of humanity falls into. Ya yuhannas u'budu rabbakum. People, worship your Lord. And for people, we have a beautiful, clear, plain, simple, open, welcoming invitation. O oh, people, worship your Lord. He created you and those who came before you in order to save yourselves from doom. He made the earth like a, a, a spread for you and the heavens your canopy. He sent down from the skies water. And th through that, he brings about fruits that you eat. So, فَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Don't now make rivals or equals to God while you know better. It's inviting humanity to reflect on the beauty of creation and recognize the, the, the majesty of the Creator. That is the invitation. Don't confuse and muddy and un up and unnecessarily make convoluted 
this message to the world. Wallahi, don't, it doesn't matter if they go on to become Hanafis or Shafi'is or Salafis or Sufis or stand up and say Salam on the Prophet or do it sitting down. Or, don't do that. It's a very simple message. This is an invitation to the world. Well, it doesn't matter if someone said to um, a student, someone who was like greatly devoted to a certain scholar and then he wouldn't, he, there was another big scholar in his town and this other scholar and his teacher had had a dispute and so they weren't really on best talking terms. So he stopped going to visit the other scholar because he's a loyal and faithful student of his own teacher. And then he saw a dream and he relates, he said, in a dream I saw the messenger of Allah Salah. And I was amazed, like I've seen the Prophet. But he looked really uh, angry towards me. So I said, Ya Rasulullah, you're displeased, what's up? And he said, why do you not go to this other, to such and such a scholar? He said, Ya Rasulullah, he, he, he and my teacher have had a dispute, so I'm obviously a, a good Hanafi, so I'm not going to the Shafi'i, or whatever it was. And the Prophet ﷺ said, do you feel no shame that you allowed one man's relationship to another man to mean more to you than his relationship with me, your Prophet? It didn't matter to you that he loves Muhammad, your messenger. He loves Allah, your creator. That wasn't a big enough reason to maintain excellent relations with him. The, the football's on. There are people who are like strongly uh, vegetarian. And then there are others who are massive meat eaters. And then there are people, of every, but they're united by this one common cause. And on this day in their colors, they're all together. Why? Because it's a, this, this trumps every other like relationship. In any other setting, I might not get on with you because you don't like what I like or you like things that I don't like. But here we will. The Prophet of Allah or Islam is about that. And so Allah says, oh people, you should be completely pleased, completely up for a person saying, la ilaha illallah muhammadun rasulullah and never once praying in the way that you pray. It doesn't matter. It's not about you or your ego or your school of thought. As long as it's a valid form according to any of the valid traditions. Okay, and so this is a very simple thing. Now I'm going to draw your attention to uh, verse 27. And Allah makes mention of something very important. He says, uh, sorry, verse, yeah, 27. الَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِيثَاقِ Just before that, the last like sentence just before that, he speaks of the Qur'an. So towards the end of 26, Allah says, يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا About the Qur'an, the book that he's just introduced as هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Guidance. But guidance for people of taqwa. He then makes this astonishing uh, statement. يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا Many does he allow to go astray through it. وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا And many others does he guide by means of it. This Qur'an is misguidance for many, while it is guidance, of course, for many. So that's like, oh, well, that, that's scary. What is it then? Is it just potluck? Will I? No. <coughs> but he does not let us uh, set astray any through it, except the fasiqeen, except people who insist on wickedness, insist on Sin. Insist on what you know to be wrong. If you choose that path, then... So in other words, you can prejudice your own self to a beautiful thing like revelation, the word of God, because of your insistence on choosing something which you know is not good for you. And so then Allah gives us a quick breakdown of who these people are, what they look like. What is the first? Here's an example. It's not just people who don't pray or don't fast or uh uh the first things he mentions those who would um, breach the covenant of God after it has been ratified and strengthened Allah's covenant now that's a term we're going to come back to and they sever they break up those Ties which Allah commanded be maintained and upheld. They are the true losers. He speaks of two things here. When he's, and you'll see this theme, this is recurring throughout the Quran and throughout Islamic literature. There are two key uh, uh, themes about revelation. It speaks about your relationship to God and it speaks about your relationship to creation. That's revelation. 
they yanqudun ahd Allah min ba'di mithaqi god's covenant they if you fail to uphold you don't worship you don't pray you don't give charity you don't do all of the things you don't stay by the halal and stay away from the haram that's the covenant of god but also you you break up your human relations you were commanded to be good to your mother or your father you were commanded to be good a friend of mine his father-in-law is a sheikh al hadith he's a sheikh of hadith he's someone who studied in umul qura for over 10 years he's a massive scholar he's the son of Jewish American parents. Allah guided him to Islam in the 70s and, uh, and he went and he dedicated his life and now he's, he's a great scholar, he teaches hadith. He's flown back to the States to be with his elderly parents for a family re reunion where everybody else, they're Jewish. They're like super wealthy Jews as well from Beverly Hills and a very old established wealthy Jewish family. But he's gone and he's there with his big beard and he's in his traditional dress and he's in like Beverly Hills with his family and he's embracing them. And you can tell that this is the, the amount of love in his eyes when he looks towards his own flesh and blood. They didn't stop being that. And they seem a world apart. <coughs> they seem a world apart. And yet they are the same flesh. Allah Azza wa reminds about this. Don't sever, don't disconnect yourself from that which God has made sacred. The rahim, the womb, relationships are sacred. So we'll talk, I say we'll talk more about the ahd later on. If you look to the next uh, to verse number 30 now, this is where Allah starts. The first story that is, is told is the story of Adam. And it's God saying, he announced to the angels, I'm going to establish a caliphate. Establishing a caliphate here, guys, a khilafa. And your Lord announced to the angels a khalifa on earth. It's the plan. And guess what the very first thing the angels said is? What is the first thing the angels, the first anxiety that they express, the first thing they're worried about? Are you going to place on earth one who will cause mayhem, chaos, corruption through the land and cause blood to flow? The first thing, now it's almost like the uh, newly found Islamic state of somewhere or other um, misread that verse and thought that was the mandate of what a caliphate is meant to look like. It needs to be lots of bloodshed and chopping off of heads and madness throughout the land it's not the purpose that's the first thing the angels were concerned about because they know that for god to appoint someone into a position of such power such authority to place such resources at his disposal means that creation is in a state of vulnerability are we going to be good by the environment are we going to be good by other animals are we going to be good by the weak and the poor and the vulnerable <coughs> among us or are we going to abuse this power? And this is the great, great concern. And this is why the true Khalifas of the Prophet ﷺ, the Khulafa al-Rashidun, those who truly followed his example, the true successors of the Prophet, they left this world penniless, like the Messenger himself did ﷺ. He left this world and he's the Prophet of God. And he's the head of the entire Islamic state and ummah and world forever. And he left this world having taken a loan from a Jewish man and ha having left like his shield with the Jewish man. Because he couldn't afford to pay back the debt. So as security, this is how he left this world. And Abu Bakr left this world and before he died, everything he'd received from Beit al-Mal, he'd returned. And, you know, there were people who were rich and they came to Islam and they left this world poor and they left this world ever rich. So this was the state, they served the people. Abu Bakr died and there were old women in Medina who realized because they, they'd gone to bed most nights and woken up and somebody had been in the night time and helped tidy their things and because they were old widows without men around and they'd find somebody's like done the flower or you know, because uh, it's hard work, physically hard work to do the whole you know, grinding, grinding um, 
uh, it flower and things like this. They'd wake up and all of this stuff's been done. And no, never an idea who's doing this, who's coming in in the night time and doing this stuff. <coughs> Abu Bakr died, it stopped happening. They realised, oh, okay, it's just the head of state. Imagine David Cameron doing your gardening. It's, like, it's just, anyway. <laughs> so this is, this, is, this is the state of these people. And the same thing was said about Hassan, the grandson of God's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they were amazing people. They, they lived to give, not to take. And this is the first thing the angels are worried about. We're going to obviously move on. Now here's, uh, if you look at verse 34, sorry, verse uh, 38. Actually, no. Verse 40. Verse 40 of Al-Baqarah. We have, O children of Israel, here we have a plea to the Israelites. Why? Why, why is the Quran, why is Al-Baqarah speaking about Israel? Well, a couple of things. First of all, this is the first time that there's direct encounter or a meaningful relationship between God's messengers, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Jewish peoples because there were pre-existing communities of Jewish uh, people in Yathrib. Why were they in Yathrib? Yathrib is, of course, Medina before it becomes Medina. Medina literally means what? What does Medina mean? The city. So everything's a city. This Medina Lister. Literally, it's the city of Leicester. This is how you'd say it. Uh, so why is Medina called the city? Because until that time, it was called Yathrib. And then the messenger came and it forevermore became known as Medina to Rasulillah. The city of God's messenger. And Medina was so proud to be a home to the messenger of God. It would have no other name apart from that. So Medina, but before that, there was a Jewish community, and they were, they, were, they were there for some time. Why were Jewish communities there? In their writings, they had it that the last messenger would come here. And they found this, identified this place. But they expected that he would be one of them. So they were settled here, awaiting that. Abdul ibn Salam is a Jewish rabbi who mentions how when we heard the Muslims, like the Arabs, is from the children of, uh, of, of Ishmael, there's a claim for a prophet. We were all a bit you know, taken aback by that. But they nonetheless came out to see. And then they saw and amazing things happened. And many of them recognized the truth. And they became companions of Muhammad Wasallam. <coughs> and there were others who couldn't because of social reasons. And so in Bani Israel, in Surah Al-Baqarah, these verses, Allah is saying, O oh, children of Israel, don't do this. There was one reason that you were honored above everyone else. And that was to be carriers of God's message. Don't turn your back on the same message. The message is still the same even though the messenger may have changed. What difference does that make? Truth is never limited or, sub or, or restricted to a certain ethnicity, a certain race, a culture. Don't, don't make the foolish mistake of thinking that it's only acceptable if it comes from our line, not if it comes from another. The truth is universal. We're going to um, take a break. <clears throat>